I was involved in a near fatal motor vehicle accident. Um, at that time, I lived in a, in a community uh, in the middle of British Columbia, Canada, and I had gone out for a weekend of camping with some work colleagues. I worked at McDonald's restaurant, like many teenagers do. And being young and naive um, and dumb, um, I didn't know that uh, getting very little sleep, I only got a, just, just over an hour of sleep that night, uh, plus a uh, significant, significant amount of alcohol, because um, you'd make really bad decisions at 16. Um, I had been drinking the night before, um, that when I got in the car the next morning to drive um, back from the campground, which was um, about 75 kilometers north of where I lived, um, that I would fall asleep. Um, I, I never knew you could fall asleep driving a car. I didn't think it was possible. And um, I did. And I was only wearing a lap belt, not the shoulder restraint. Um, so it was just the lap belt. I was by myself in the car. I left the highway. Uh, it was an elevated curve. So the highway went like this and I pitched it down over the bank. And the action of the car um, rolling end over end and the seat belt being across my stomach and instead of my hips, because I had fallen asleep, um, pretty much tore me in half internally. It tore through my abdominal wall, my large and small bowel, and into my stomach. And um, I was lying at the bottom of a bank, uh, bleeding to death and dying. And, and, and I offered that I was dying, um, not in any sort of hysterical way or anything like that. It's just the simple truth. Um, I was at a moment in my life when I knew I was dying. Um, I clearly, uh, one of the few memories I have is vividly uh, remembering lying in the dirt, begging to die because the pain was so terrible. Death was uh, truly um, welcome at that point. Um, clearly it didn't happen. Um, people saw me leave the highway and uh, I was able to get to uh, the trauma center, which was about 40 kilometers away and uh, immediately into surgery. So that started my road down uh, this path called chronic pain. So, um, the, the initial surgery, which was uh, about seven hours in the OR, uh, two weeks in the intensive care unit, and then a week on the ward, um, was just the beginning of what um, ultimately led to be multiple surgeries um, over the years. Um, multiple, um, I had a, a temporary colostomy and it was reversed. I had multiple um, bowel obstructions which needed to be repaired. So I had uh, a large amount of abdominal surgery in the first two to three years after my accident. Um, and among all of that, um, I realized there was always underlying pain. Um, and, and that led me on a, on a path of trying to find out why I had pain. Um, so I kept going to the doctors and, and it got to the point, just to compress this story, it got to the point where they, um, they said, there's nothing more they can do for you. Um, we've repaired everything that was broken. Um, there's nothing left to fix. So you, you can't have any pain anymore. And I was told it was all in my head um, and that I just needed to just basically leave them alone and go away. And, and I was about 19 or 20 at the time I was told this. So um, that set me on a rather uh, difficult course for a while because I, I did think maybe I was making this all up, that I was attention seeking, that I was some sort of, you know, I, I just didn't, I didn't know why. I would be doing this, but um, underneath all of this was this ongoing, um, at times relentless pain. And I was then thrust out of the medical system to try and figure out how to deal with this on my own. And I, and I didn't do it very well. Um, my way of trying to deal with it back in the 80s and the 90s was to, uh, to try and fight through it, um, push, um, do things, that looking back now were, were really counterproductive, like you know, sort of take on projects and, and, and work that were very physical because I was always determined not to let this thing called pain, um, but I didn't really understand what it was, uh, define my life. But it, it ultimately would. I, I would wind up going into the hospital sometimes two, three times a year for breakthrough uh, pain. It would just become so bad, spike, um, I would be on the floor just rolling in pain. Um, I'd have to be taken to the emergency room and they would spend, you know, 24 hours or sometimes I'd be in the hospital for four or five days until they got it under control. And it was this cycle of um, fight through the pain, ignore it, uh, push, break through pain into the hospital, and then do, do this over and over again. Um, 
Ultimately, I kept looking for ways to try and manage the pain. Um, as I got a little older and hopefully smarter, I started to move away from the fighting um, because it was so counterproductive um, to trying to find other clinicians who might be able to help me. And I was um, seeing a, a doctor getting nerve block injections, um, paravertebral nerve block injections, um, which ultimately had very minimal effect. It would last a couple of three months and then wear off. And after two or three rounds of those, which um, are a little uncomfortable on their own, and in one of the sessions, um, uh, the doctor, and I do not blame him at all, I have so much respect for the man, but he, uh, he did go a little deep on the, on the injection and, and uh, gave me a bit of a pneumothorax. It, it did resolve on its own, I didn't need a chest tube, but it was at this point that he realized that he'd probably done all that he could do and we weren't getting any um, lasting effects. And he recommended me to a hospital in Vancouver, British Columbia, that was doing something in um, the neuromodulation world. And he'd heard of these things called spinal cord stimulators, and he thought it might be something for me to check into. So fast forward or rewind, I guess, back to 2005, um, I went to, uh, to St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, British Columbia, and ultimately was deemed to be a candidate for spinal cord stimulation. Um, I was given the implant in 2005. Um, it's, uh, I'm a bit of a smaller cohort of spinal cord stimulator patients. Um, most have it for distal limb uh, pain or where it's very effective. Um, for me being more um, in the abdominal area, trunk pain, uh, it's a little harder to target, um, but we did get some success. And um, it was, it proved to be um, the first tool um, that provided me uh, some better pain management. So that coupled with a very brief introduction into self-management, which I knew nothing about, uh, led me on a road of where I am today, which is to better understand pain as much as I can. I continue to learn and to research and to understand the importance of self-management and the critical importance of the patient being an integral part of their health care. It's just simply uh, ineffective, in my opinion, to try and treat somebody or help somebody manage chronic pain if you don't actively engage them in their care and find out what's going on. And I think the healthcare system needs to flip the lens a little bit. And instead of putting all of the pressure and the responsibility on the practitioners and the doctors to say, here is my problem, you need to fix it. Um, you need to bring the two together and say, together, let's find uh, the best way through this and what can work because I've been down the road of either leave it to the doctor to fix it and when they can't um, you get sort of ejected out of the system and it's not because they don't care I believe now looking back it's because they don't know what to do and they have no more tools left so this involvement of patient-centric care and involving the patient in their care is, is foundational to um, more effective um, chronic pain management. So with that, um, and, and I'll just offer uh, that the, the spinal cord stimulator that I have um, was replaced in 2015. Uh, spinal cord stimulation does not take pain away. And those of you who are clinicians and understand pain will know that it's not that simple, but it, it just, it stopped it from being the main blaring thing in my brain all the time. Uh, sort of lowered that alarm level a little bit that coupled with self-management and a lot of the things that I learned about stress and relaxation and breathing and a few other things started to help me uh, be able to live uh, better um, with pain. So it was really quite transformative for me to find out that there was a way that I could also help myself, which is a key part of what we're going to talk about. Um, and, um, but the pain, I mean, it's, it's always there. Um, in 2015, I had to have the system replaced because it was the end of life of the technology. And again, due to the complexities of the human body and a number of things, um, it has been um, quite ineffective since 2015, despite four further attempts to revise the implant and to get it to work. And it just, it just won't. And I'm currently um, sort of uh, waiting for new technology that's just been approved in Canada for something called dorsal root ganglion stimulation. It's been used in the US and maybe other parts of the world for a number of years. It's new to Canada. Um, and, and my medical team believes this is something that will target the root nerves a little better. So um, 
I offer this because there are some people who have pain who their pain experience was was pretty bad and they say that they now um, have come through their pain and that doesn't necessarily mean they're pain free but they're in a much much better place um, I certainly am but it is still something that I, I deal with every day to the point where um, this morning even when I get up the first thing that goes through my mind when I get up in the morning is okay what's it going to take to get through the day today because it takes a lot of energy sometimes to just get going through the day so with that um, when we talk about validation and understanding, this is something that was, was really missing for me in the early part of my healthcare um, because it wasn't validated and it wasn't understood. And so that lack of both of those left me on my own and led me to think, um, yeah, okay, it's, it's all in my head and, and I'm probably crazy, but why would I do this to myself? Um, I think I can speak for a lot of people, not everybody. Um, and again, this is my own personal experience, but the, the validation is really one of the cues that can unlock the door to start to live better with pain. Because until the system, the medical system, uh, validates a person's pain experience, they do feel like they're on their own and that they are making it up. And the, all these other emotional, psychological thoughts that go through their, their mind, which are completely counterproductive. For me, um, it was the intake um, uh, to the spinal cord stimulation um, technology. Um, when I was sitting with the doctor, the intake doctor was filling out the form. I remember him asking a bunch of questions and I think probably by rote, I was just answering them, you know, the surgeries and why, and you kind of check out a little bit because you're just sort of going through it again. Um, when I realized that he had stopped talking and I kind of thought I'd done something wrong or maybe they had already realized that I was crazy and so I wasn't a candidate. And I looked at him and he had put his pen down and he said these simple three words, we believe you. And I cannot tell you how emotionally powerful that was. It probably broke down the wall that I had built over the years, trying to isolate myself from um, being perceived as drug seeking or um, not able to get on with my life or any of these other emotional thoughts that I had. And when he said, we believe you, I just about fell apart. Um, and, and that was the turning point for me um, to be open to a number of things that I closed off before, um, any kind of self-management ideas or even being open to the fact that the body and the mind are connected. I didn't believe that even existed. Um, to, to being open to that and, and starting to understand what can I do um, to help myself. But th that validation is critical because chronic pain can be overwhelming. It's like I said, when I get up in the morning, I'm not kidding. I mean, it, my feet hit the floor and I take a deep breath and I'm like, okay, here we go again, Meldrum. And what's it going to be like today? And what's it going to take? My first move is mentally getting worked up or ready to just get through the shower in the morning because that takes a lot of my energy and I don't offer that again to you know as, as as any kind of sort of hysterical point that's just the reality of what so many people live with every day so simple day-to-day -day tasks will drain the energy that's in their bank you've only got so much every day um, this is people who are healthy. Our lives are busy. If you've got, you know, your work and children, um, that drains your battery. Throw on top of that, and many people listening to this, I'm sure, have pain as well. Throw on top of just life. You've got this thing which is constantly blaring in your brain, and that battery drains pretty quickly. So um, that validation um, and, and understanding of those that we look to as the authority is, is pretty critical. Um, because people feel misunderstood by their family and the, and the system. Um, and it's also important to understand that pain is, is very individualistic. How I manage or deal with or, or my pain experience is completely different than somebody else's. And um, that's important for people who have pain to understand you can't measure your pain against somebody else's. It's really, I believe, of little value. It's, it's, it's how you experience it and then how you deal with it. So, um, just quickly going to talk a little bit about the um, sort of understanding of pain and I just offer these slides and I'll quickly go through them because um, it's clearly something that society has been dealing with for a long time and wrestling with. So 
you know, we go back to the 1600s um, when back then scientists thought there was, you know, this pain center in the brain, um, not really too far off, I guess we could say. Um, and, and they talk about a ringing bell when the nerves were tugged on by something that was damaging to your body. Well, those that are, are pain scientists and researchers, you know, this might speak a little bit to things like nociception and all that really cool advanced um, pain science stuff. But we've been dealing with this for a long time and we still don't really know everything, even though we've come a long way. But we know pain is complex and we know the purpose of pain is to protect the body. It, it, it is a very valuable thing in our lives. Otherwise, we'd keep putting our hand on the hot stove and not know to pull it back. It's when that system goes out of whack that it goes into chronic pain and becomes a problem. So, um, again, we know it's about, uh, you know, the, the, the job of the brain is to analyze the information coming in and, and that protection. Um, I like to sort of use this as a simple example, you know, you twist your ankle and the alarm is to let you know that more movement may cause damage. Um, the repeated twist on it, twisted ankle though is pain causing you to tense up when, when nearing uneven ground. So it is a truly protective mechanism and when it works, it works well. And when it goes out of phase, that's when it's a problem. This is when it's not necessarily an accurate indication of what is occurring. And an example of that is when we talk about things like referred pain. Um, so how can you have pain somewhere else when that's not where the, the biological or the tissue damage is? Empathy pain. I'm sure many people or some people can um, relate to this, you know, pain that you feel for others when they get hurt. Um, I don't think we need to go through much of this in detail. I'm, I'm sure uh, many people sort of understand um, sort of the, the biology or the mechanics behind pain. But again, it is it's the body's protective system, you know, the, the, the nervous system um, sends the signal up to the brain. Um, if we didn't have a nervous system or a brain, then there would be no way to, to experience pain. So um, we know it's not localized. When you, when you cut your finger, it's not your finger per se, in that sense, that's where the pain's coming from. It's, it's the, the signals that go up to the brain and the brain says, hey, that's danger, that's damage and, and creates that awareness of the pain. So um, when that all works well, it, it works really well. That's what, again, protects us. Um, it's again, when it goes out of sort of normal that it causes the problems. So um, nerves, the, the one bullet point here, nerves in the brain start to produce hormones that increase the body's stress reactions of, of the fight or flight. That also speaks to the stressors in pain. And when we talk about chronic pain, how um, the stress response can increase your pain. And, and now we start to get into that complexity of chronic pain and, and the body-mind connection that is so important. Um, things that can be affected uh, with pain, it's really important for people who, who live with pain to find the right things to do, and that's very individualistic, and practice them uh, over and over. Um, and that will, it's sort of a graded exposure. Um, it's desensitizing the body as much as it can. Um, easier said to done, these are, this is at a very high level and um, the professionals who work with people who have pain are much better at explaining this, but it's, it's that graded exposure, finding anything that you can do, slowly working it up to get your body's pain alarm signal, for lack of a better term, to start to, to adjust that down and, and be a little more open to those kind of movements or activities. So, um, the history of the the treatment of pain. We'll look how far back we go. We go back so far as the thirty four hundred, you know, thirty four hundred BC, um, where you know the Sumerians talked about joy plants uh, for pain relief. One sense, maybe we haven't come that far in in all this time. <laughs> Uh, 400 BC, um, Hippocrates recommends chewing on willow tree bark uh, for pain relief. Um, you know, 1300s, the Europeans had, you know, ideas on pain control. What we see is, is pain has been part of society and a possibly a focal part of society for years as people have tried to understand what it is and how to deal with it. Um, 1600s, now we start to see the use of opium. Uh, so now we're getting into, um, you know, more of the pain relief um, technologies that we're used to seeing now. 
Um, the 1800s, um, morphine now starts to come into play. Um, in 1820, Bayer produces morphine on an industrial scale. Um, I, I like this one. 1846, the first use of an anesthetic during surgery, um, where religious writers call, uh, we called it a violation of God's law. They believe that pain is God's way to strengthen human faith. Um, I'm going to offer that's a miss. Um, that's not really a violation of, of any law. <laughs> I can't imagine having surgery without anesthetic. And I've had a lot of surgery. So, um, again, I, I won't sort of go through all of these. I just, I share these and I'm happy to share any of this, this PowerPoint with anybody might want it afterwards, um, just because it has been something that has been part of society and medicine, um, Western medicine is as much as I understand it for so many years and trying to understand what it is and how to treat it. Um, so, and, and in the last, you know, hundred years or so, we've really seen um, a rise, uh, rise in the use of opioids and other um, uh, synthetic opioids for pain control. Um, 1960s, fentanyl um, enters the stage and, and we all know just how tragically terrible that has been and is every single day still. Um, we see it in British Columbia and in, you know, in Canada and North America, the devastation that fentanyl has. Um, so again, these are not really, you know, germane to our, to talk other than, uh, this is just something that we've been dealing with for such a long time. I do want to talk a little bit about, um, what we're seeing in, in North America and Canada and in the U S about, um, uh, they call it the opioid crisis and how there's been a tie, um, to people who have pain. And I'm not saying there isn't, and I, I'm not a researcher and I haven't studied this to death, but, um, I believe it's been skewed a little too much to say that opioid, the spike in opioid deaths and overdoses is directly related to people in pain. Um, in British Columbia, in last year, the chief coroner for BC said the opioid crisis is largely the, re the result of one drug, fentanyl. That fentanyl we know in British Columbia throughout North America is something that is being used at the street level, being imported from other places and is so, so tragically addictive and so dangerous, um, I, I believe the cause is not 100% related to people who have chronic pain. So uh, these are just charts that just um, sort of talk about the, the spike um, in overdose deaths when, um, with, with respect to fentanyl. So that's British Columbia. Um, this is mirrored in, in Boston, um, in Massachusetts. And again, this was part of my presentation. So I, I brought that link together because it shows both Canada and the US saw very, very similar results. So um, talk a little bit now about, um, as part of validation and understanding about words. Um, I can offer is the critical importance that words play in people's day-to-day -day lives when they have pain. Um, the words that they use between themselves and their healthcare practitioners, um, with their family, their friends, the words they use to themselves in their heads, um, these have a lot of power and add to the patient experience and often in a negative way. Um, patients are often in a place of vulnerability, thinking there is something wrong with them, they're broken. In my case, there is no biomedical or biological issue anymore. Um, and it took me a long time to really reconcile that in my head, knowing that this pain didn't mean there was something structurally underlying that I was damaging every time I moved a certain way and it hurt. Um, so that doesn't mean it didn't hurt. What I needed to understand and what I continue to work to understand is it doesn't necessarily mean there's something underlying that I'm damaging per se. Um, that doesn't mean I go off half cocked and doing things and pain be damned because it's still painful, but understanding that for me, there's no broken bone, there's no ripped tissue, there's no biomedical biological issue, but the pain is real, allowed me to start to work towards what can I do to better live with that pain and manage the pain, knowing that there's nothing broken. Um, I think that is really important and it's a really hard concept to wrap your head around sometimes. Um, and so to when we think we're broken and we talk about being broken or this is hitched or caught, um, that is, a, those just add negative connotations to the patient pain experience and, and 
keeps them in a position of vulnerability and um, fear, and we, we need to get out of that. Um, the words we hear from others really are words that we take on ourselves. Um, I, certainly for me, it was so much so. Um, they become part of, of how we make our, our experiences and our belief systems, um, who we are, what we're capable of. So if, you know, the clinician or our family says, well, you shouldn't do that because, you know, it's going to hurt you um, or that's broken or something is misaligned, that becomes part of our experience and sometimes it's not helpful at all. Um, let's just think of some of the common words that are used when people are dealing with the healthcare system. Um, often, you know, underlying general terms, we talk about damage, weak, torn, asymmetrical, degenerating, dysfunction, subluxation. This all adds into this triangle of, of uh, pain, fear, tension. When patients hear these words, and again, I'm relating some of this to when it's come to the point where they, there's an understanding there's no biomedical or biological issue anymore. It's not like you got a bone sticking out of your arm. That's a different story. When these are the words that are used by the clinicians, when you go in there and the healthcare provider tells you some of these, uses some of these terms, you know, you're weak and you're asymmetrical. I don't, you know, I know what asymmetrical means because I'm in engineering, but what does that mean in the human body really? Like, I don't know other than it puts the fear of God into me. Um, dysfunction is probably one of the worst terms that we can use for somebody who has pain. These words will stick in people's heads and they will be in the back of their mind every time they move or try to move uh, and cause them not to move. So we want to be very careful in the words that we use. Part of what we want to do with people is to get them to a place where they can start to help themselves and, and understanding that experience requires the patient or the person living with pain, um, I think is a better way to describe it, to be at that place where they can. And when you're in pain and you're um, dealing with all of that and you're dealing with some of these negative concepts and this pressure, it's a little bit hard to get there, but we want people to know that there is hope and hope isn't a bad thing at all. Dictionary definition says hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. Hope is not a bad thing. Um, it's actually really important. It allows, whether it's a pain experience or any other kind of life experience, uh, when we have hope, we are in a better place to keep trying and doing things. And it doesn't necessarily mean everything's gonna work out. It's all gonna be sunshine and roses but it does um, allow us to continue to move forward. Hope is not a new concept by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, we go back many, many years um, when, you know, Hippocrates wrote, it's the natural healing force within each of us is the greatest force for getting well. It is such a powerful statement. And again, I relate to my own experience. Once I got out of the, the fighting model of pushing and battling and even using all those terms fight battle doesn't help when i got past that and realized that there are things that i can do and i can be hopeful for a, a better more fulsome life m my experience with my pain certainly changed from what it was which was not very good meldrum in the hospital three times a month get needles stuck in his hip because the pain was blinding to where i know i have not set foot in an er for breakthrough pain control since 2004. Hope can mistakenly be bundled with optimism, wishful thinking, even denial, but there are important distinctions. Optimism is hopefulness and confidence about the future or the success of something, whereas hope tends to be focused on achieving specific goals. So um, hope, like, that's an important message to get across to people. Um, we're going to quickly go through now the, the patient, well, not quickly, the, the patient voice and engagement. And if we do nothing else, we'll, we'll get through this. Um, engagement is, is just as the slide says here, is to promote and, promote and support active patient and public involvement in health and healthcare, and to strengthen their influence, healthcare decisions at both the individual and collective levels. Basically, what we're saying is involving the patient in their healthcare, actively involving them, 
having them be a participant, not a spectator, or often sometimes even just kind of left on the side, goes much further in effectively dealing with the patient and getting them to a better place than, than just treating them as an object. Um, to the point where the World Health Organization has underlined the necessity of encouraging an active and participatory role for patients in order to enhance their well-being and to improve the efficiency of the healthcare system. That says it all right there. And it is nothing more complicated than patient engagement. That doesn't cost money. That doesn't require new infrastructure. That requires a change in thinking and conversations. Quickly, I'm going to go through a bunch of these slides because patient engagement, patient voice can come in a number of different ways. This slide here is from the Ministry of Health in British Columbia, Canada, uh, and a plan that they're um, working on that PNBC is a huge part of, actually drove them to get to. Um, but engagement um, has these three domains. We talk individual, community, and system, system design. Um, individual care is just that, um, the, you know, values and goals, choices, uh, patient interests, actions, um, in managing their health. If people, as a person who lives with pain, I have to be actively engaged in managing my health. I can't turn it over to you as the clinicians and say it's your responsibility. I have a huge part to play in this. Um, actions and relationships with others, um, working together to create change. This is as the individual, this is the individual's role. And again, I would offer as somebody who's lived with pain and for the first 20 years, I looked to the system to fix me and fix it. Um, that went nowhere until I became an active participant. So the, the individual care and allowing that, that can only come about when you're validated, you're understood, and you're invited to participate in your healthcare. Uh, there's community involvement. Um, developing some examples here, just developing tools for surgical patient education websites. Um, development of peer support groups. These are very, very important. These are really important in the communities. Um, community engagement is starting to happen more and more. We're starting to see them both um, physical, so people being engaged within their community physically, um, but social media is also allowing for a lot of online um, and social interaction, which is huge. It is having a tremendous effect in this space. Um, and then system redesign. Uh, I think we can all agree that's not a a simple uh, issue to overcome, but uh, systemically uh, change needs to occur and need to get out of a, a purely medical focused model of patient, clinician, you have a problem, we fix you to this sort of symbiotic. And I believe it is truly symbiotic. I believe both sides get a bunch out of it when you bring the two together and you have engagement. So it goes right back though uh, if I leave you with nothing else today, it goes back to the importance of individual uh, participation in the healthcare. And an individual really cannot participate until the system or process or a single individual doctor says, we believe you and they invite you into their healthcare. Until then, you are left on the outside looking in, trying to wonder what the hell's going on. Um, again, just speaking of the different levels of engagement, um, uh, there is a growing, growing movement in some countries towards patient engagement. Um, I've had the opportunity over the last year to be involved in a few more things um, internationally, and we're seeing some of this start to pop up, but it's very ad hoc. Um, uh, different groups, different organizations are trying to do what they can, but there's really no best practices. Um, there's no set to, you know, there's no yeah, there's just no best practices. There's a lot of people trying to figure out what, what needs to be done, but we're seeing change happen slowly, but surely. Um, the most critical aspect of engagement for effective individual patient care is, is the patient narrative, and that's the patient story. Um, and that's engaging the patient actively into their health care. Um, the patient, current medical practice is dominated by evidence-based medicine as somebody who's taken engineering evidence data and science is really important to me um, i don't do very well building the things that we do unless it's based on evidence <laughs> uh, but in medicine um, it can't it, it can't be all just the facts and the figures you've got a human being sitting in front of you and when you involve them um, 
it, it is a much healthier, effective relationship. Um, you know, at the end here, it says when taken, you know, uh, taken alone, it decentralizes the patient. It does. When your patient being treated purely as a set of symptoms, you um, can feel quite disengaged and almost not part of the process. You just feel like an object that is being worked on. I like to use this as an example. Um, if we were auto mechanics, if healthcare was in auto mechanics, um, it, it would be this picture here. Um, mechanics, especially with new uh, vehicular technology, must rely on um, their training and the diagnostic tools. They bring in my, my vehicle, they plug it in, the diagnostic software tells them what's wrong and they fix it based on their education. Um, that's because they don't have somebody like a vehicle that can talk back to them, have a conversation with them, explain to them what's going on. I would offer that the model on the other side where it's the engaged conversation is much more effective than what we see where you just plug in and then fix it. Um, so essentially that's what narrative medicine is. It's, it's recognizing the individual and the patient. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about pain scales. Um, so I'm just gonna go back here for a moment, pardon me. The um, evaluation with the visual analog scale is, is getting to be hopefully more commonly used. Um, and, that, and this will drive treatment, um, I believe in a better way, and we're gonna talk a little bit why here in a moment, because um, it assesses the impact that the pain has on the patient's daily uh, life and the quality of their life. And, and I think it's really important, and we're gonna get to that here in a moment as to why. Um, this diagram you know, explains narrative medicine um, a little bit um, and you know ranking my pain and the impact of pain on me um, two vastly different things ranking my pain um, the old one to ten scale versus what is the impact of pain on me like I said it's getting up in the morning and how I get to have a shower um, for me the water on my left side hurts like hell so the shower experience for me is not really a joyful thing um, so what that's part of the impact on pain. I mean, how does that rank on a one to 10 scale? I don't really care. Um, it just hurts like hell and makes what is normally an enjoyable experience be something that's not really that enjoyable. My bias and, and you'll see here why is I'm not a big fan of the, uh, the pain score rating. And I think we're seeing a shift towards that. Um, because you know, it talks about your worst pain from zero to you know zero being no pain, ten being the worst pain you've ever had in your life. Um, well, for me, the worst pain I ever had in my life was being ripped in half in a car accident and nearly dying. So when somebody says to me, "What's your pain on a zero to 10? Well, it can't be a ten because I was praying to God to die. So anything other than that's kind of a walk in the park. So what is it? A two, a three, a four, a five? What? I don't even know where to land that. And when I do. What does it mean to them? So let's just agree uh, or not, but in my opinion, there's no value in, in the uh, numerical pain scale. Um, I see we're running out of time here. We're a quarter to one. So um, we'll talk about the importance of self-management here for a few minutes. Um, self-management is very important because um, it does uh, involve the patient in, or the person with the pain in their care. And uh, from my personal experience, I learned a number of important tools and techniques to help manage my pain. Um, breathing, relaxation, learning how to reduce my stress um, were all tools that I, I didn't have before and I did everything sort of counter to that. Um, when I was under stress, I would fight through it instead of now sort of accepting that stress in and trying to understand it and find ways to better management. It is really, really, really important that patients find a way, best way they can for self-management. It can't all be on the clinician. This gets into the biopsychosocial model. Um, I believe very strongly in this. I'm still trying to learn as much as I can. And I think we don't know as much as maybe sometimes we think we know, um, but uh, it's truly pain experience is not just a biomedical, biological experience. It is absolutely psychological and socially uh, impacted. Um, and understanding that and finding ways to deal with it are very, very important. So this is read, led to the raise of 
um, to the rise of pain science um, and understanding that pain science is not a modality, it's not a treatment tool, it's just a way to try and understand what the pain experience is and how that relates to the patient. Um, it's not a set of protocols or procedures. Again, it's just a lot of the things that we talked about in, in, in um, sort of the neurobiology and the psychology and the sociology of people and their pain. Um, it's a little bit kind of all over the map right now. Um, it, you know, sort of traditional medicine, which was you're broken, I fix you. Pain science is trying to find its way. At times I see some groups get a little bit too far one way, but it's probably somewhere in the middle. But um, the, the importance of pain and understanding it is really very important to helping people live better with pain. Uh, and, and in that, as part of the pain science of the, the biopsychosocial model is, is the tenets of self-management exercise, <clears throat> pardon me, just gotta grab some water. Um, exercise and movement are critical. I do what I can within my pain experience, but I still get exercise. I, movement is better than not, hugely. Um, relaxation techniques, oh, pardon me. Um, the breathing, um, mindfulness, whatever works for people, they have to find their tool and go with it. So um, I'm a big fan of exercise and movement. Um, because I know back in the 80s after my accident, I was always told, don't move, just rest. Um, and now there's a fine line between not doing enough and overdoing it, but not doing any movement or exercise is terrible, terrible. Um, so I go to the gym a couple, three times a week, do a light jog on a treadmill because it doesn't hurt my body. I lift some light weights the way I can. Anything I can do to just get my body going and it helps my mind. I feel physically and emotionally engaged. Um, it also helps uh, lower that pain threshold alarm that we've talked about, um, that gra uh, graded exposure. Um, you've got to find that line and where it starts to hurt, then back off. But find what you can do and just keep sort of working at it and you'll, you'll eventually move that threshold up a little more. So um, for exercise and movement, it's about doing what you can and not overdoing it. Um, so you don't want to push through it. You want to do what you can. Um, and finding the correct approach. Again, that's not overdoing it. Do not push too hard um, because you don't want this to be a negative experience. So I think the last thing that we're going to talk about here is the critical importance of, of acceptance um, or willingness. Um, uh, Dr. Bronnie Lennox Thompson, she's an OT PhD in uh, New Zealand. And I think she's one of the well, I've really connected with her. So my bias is I think her mindset is aligned with mine, but um, she, she refers to uh, acceptance as willingness. And, and the reason we talk about that is um, until a person who has pain is willing to accept that, and that doesn't mean giving up or giving in, but understanding that this is part of them. And now we need to find ways to live better with it. And some people can work through to really reducing their pain experience, or in my case, to a point where I just live much better despite it. Acceptance can have a bit of a negative connotation because it means we're giving up or giving in, when in fact what we're saying is, no, we just recognize this, this exists, this experience, this pain, and it's not pretty and it's not fun, but it's, it's, it, it's there, but I can, I can deal with that and I can find ways to live better despite it. Um, that is a critical turning point as well. That's one of the other critical keys in being able to live well with pain. So, um, Michael J. Fox is a Canadian actor um, who was severely struck with a serious um, health issue early on in his career. And he's got a couple of great quotes. Acceptance doesn't mean resignation. It means understanding that something is what it is and there's got to be a way through it. And he says his serenity is directly proportional to his acceptance and inversely proportional to his expectations. Those just really resonated with me. So again, acceptance doesn't, um, doesn't mean life stops. Um, it just, it, it allows people to understand where they're at with their experience of their pain and find ways to deal with it. Um, not in all individuals experience pain um, interference with, not all individuals experience pain interference with goal pursuits to the same extent because interference is likely to be dependent on pain attitude. That statement really is just about how we view and um, accept our pain 
is is how we will live with it on a day-to-day -day basis so it's either i have pain i'm not going to do anything i'm not going to get off the couch or i have pain but today i'm going to get up and i'm going to do what i can despite it um, sometimes easier said than done people who have pain need to be in a place in their life where they're able to make that move forward and that can't happen until we've gone through the process of validation acceptance understanding and they can work with people um, who can help them move that forward because it's really hard to say i'm going to move forward even though i have pain you just it's it's almost counterintuitive so um, we've talked about willingness um, uh, resilience is part of willingness and acceptance uh, in a way um, Resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, and tragedy. Um, and resilience is, is, I would offer, one of the um, key tenets to being able to live well with pain. Um, it's, it's a way to continue to move forward despite those days when it's really tough and maybe you, you don't want to. Um, uh, resiliency is, is ordinary. It's not extraordinary, uh, even though we might think it is. Um, and it doesn't mean that we don't experience difficulties or distress um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it just means we find ways to deal with it and to move forward. So, um, and it's not a trait that people have or don't have. Um, it, it involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned and developed. And I, would, in my own experience, I would strongly support that. Um, go back 20 years, I was not um, an accepting, willing, willing or resilient person, really. I was an angry, mad, frustrated, thought the healthcare system had given up on me person. And until I started to move into some of these spaces and these thoughts, um, did my own personal experience uh, improve. Um, there are contributing factors for resiliency, um, so making realistic plans, um, positivity, communication skills, um, having connections, um, uh, avoid seeing crises or um, catastrophizing. Um, so there's a number of ways that you can build resiliency. Again, it's, it's, it's not there or not. It's something sometimes you have to work at and it involves a little bit of effort, but the payoff I would offer is substantial. Um, again, I'm, I'm a big fan of re resiliency, so I, I have a number of points on this, but it's, it's really important. It's the um, the positive view of yourself, it can be hard when you're really in a lot of pain, but we don't want to divide, define ourselves by our pain. So you, you got to continue to find that positive outlook, keeping things in perspective, which can be really tough. Everything can feel very insurmountable, but this isn't going to be the be all and the end all hope, you know, for your life. And that hopefulness, hope is not a bad thing. Look after yourself. That is really important. Um, I believe it also helps if you can find people who can help you. So mentors or coaches or people, not necessarily, you're not looking for somebody to give you all the answers. And sometimes maybe you don't even want somebody to talk. You just want them to be there for you. Um, but this is a really tough thing, this journey, and I don't like that term, but of, of living every day with pain and we can't always do it on our own. And uh, that was one of the other important things that I learned was once I stopped trying to do it on my own and even excluding my family, I would keep my wife out by telling her I was always fine and she knew I wasn't. Um, but until you allow people into your life and you find people who can help you and support you, um, it's, I would offer it's much harder to move forward. So mentors and coaches are really important. Find people that they can align with and, 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 and work with them. Um, why this matters is simply validating, understanding, and engaging patients are critical components of the efficacy of positive health care and pain management. I truly believe, and this all ties into engaging the patient or the person with pain in their care, is it, it, there needs to be meaningful, positive engagement. Um, and this is what will spark that fire within them to be part of their own health care. Um, resiliency also speaks to the pain spiral. Um, this is pain BC's graphic. So um, without resiliency and some of the things that we've talked about, you can have a pain centered life. And with some of the good things that we've talked about, you can have the improved quality of life. Uh, personally, I lived this model for over 20 years and 
since probably 2004, I've lived this model. And the improved quality of life one is something I'm quite happy and much happier to live in. We'll continue, this is the path I'm gonna to continue to follow. Um, so what can clinicians, other healthcare providers can do? It really speaks to engaging their patients. If, if, if you hear nothing from me today, please take that it is so important to validate their pain experience. Invite them into their care, listen to them, engage them. They're a human being with hopes, fears, emotions, needs, desires. They don't want to live like this. I'm much happier living this life than I was the challenging existence I had when I was left on my own. So treat the patient, not the symptom. And as clinicians, those of you that are clinicians, continue to challenge your bias. We're learning lots. The, the technologies and stuff that we have now, like new stuff is coming out all the time. Let's not jump to the new technology or flavor of the day. Let's, let's be tempered and, and let's critically think about what we're doing because everything that you pass on to the people who live with pain, they will take that in. And then if it changes next week, that really adds to the confusion of their life. So we've gone from almost sometimes doing very little to almost overwhelming people with now it's this or that, or next week it's that. So that's really important that we're, we're careful in what we're saying to people. I've offered some resources, which I'm happy to share with people if you would like uh, the PowerPoint presentation. I think there's some good things out there. And as patients, add to your narrative. You know, and people who live with pain, if you have to, invite yourself in. Sometimes you gotta push a little bit. Be an active participant. Learn and accept acceptance and resilience. And that's my presentation. And I went a little longer than I thought. I'm terribly sorry, Jim. <laughs> uh, that's my contact information if anybody would like anything. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks, Keith. I think it was worth going a little longer. Thanks so much. Listen, we have um, time for questions. And, um, you know, I'm happy to kind of take questions past one if uh, people do have some and want to stay on the line. Keith, are you okay with that? I am. Yeah. Sorry, Jen, I, I tried to do it in 45 minutes. I just can't. Really well. Yeah. <laughs> so for everyone <laughs> wondering, uh, Keith cut this down from like a three hour workshop. So, uh, <laughs> so it went a little fast. Sorry, everybody. We kind of glossed over a few things. <laughs> well, did incredibly well. Um, so I do have a question from Carleen. Yeah. Um, so Carlene's asking, uh, do you have any recommendations for patients that not only deal with chronic daily pain, but are also dealing with the threat of ongoing hospital stays for an acute condition? Um, and she adds, I can deal with the pain, um, but I don't know if I have the strength to fight through another hospital stay and the recovery that follows. Good question. Uh, that's a very good question. Um... I, I think I can kind of somewhat relate to that. And um, I know because uh, sometimes some of my pain experience would involve a hospital stay. And, and that was sometimes because I was going to go in and they were going to have, I was going to have surgery just as they were rooting around to see what was going to go on. And I had to balance this. Um, what do I do about this pain and going through another surgery and being cut open from stem to, to stern. Um, so I guess the only thing that I can offer, and, and I say this knowing that I'm going to be having another surgery um, on my spinal cord soon, is um, if, if the procedure of the hospital stay is not somebody just rooting around looking for a solution, but if it is uh, an effective part of your care, um, you know, if it's part of the plan or part of the program, is as daunting as that can be sometimes, if the end goal or if it's a piece in the puzzle of your care, of the plan, um, you know, look at it as part of the plan and that you're participating in that and you're saying, well, I need to go through this because by doing this, the end goal is to get to where I want to go or work towards that goal. And it's not fun. I mean, I've been probably 40 or 50 hospital admissions and 18 surgeries, and I don't know anybody who says, yeah, I get to go in the hospital because I don't find it fun at all. And every time I go in for surgery, my anxiety goes up a little bit because I'm a human being. Um, but knowing that it is part of a plan that I'm participating in, and hopefully she is, um, you know, it's part of trying to have some of that control and finding that resiliency and, and just, you know, getting through, um, but hopefully by being a participant in the, in the care, not having it just foisted upon you. That's about all I can think of, I guess. Great, great advice. Thanks, Keith. 
Um, okay, I just want to share one comment from you and then there's one other question. Um, so Lynette has just commented that she's joining from Nova Scotia and is happy that she has. So just wanted to pass on a thanks for an excellent presentation. Great. I have lots of family in Nova Scotia. My dad's a blue noser, so that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, okay, a question from Karen Keith. Um, oh, and another question coming in. Fantastic. Okay, uh, from Karen. Karen's sharing that um, she's had fibromyalgia for 27 years. Mm -hmm. And even as a health professional, she still finds it difficult to different, differentiate fibro pain from regular pain. Do you have any suggestions? I, I don't, and because I have to um, uh, be completely honest, my pain experience is uh, so different with trauma, and my pain is neuropathic pain, which is probably a little easier to um, understand in some sense because it was from trauma and there was a, a that incident that it caused it. Um, from what I understand about fibromyalgia, it is extremely painful, and um, I. I and having never experienced it, I've just had people tell me what it's like. Um, I think I would be remiss in trying to offer any advice in that. It is something I'm just, I, I don't know much about, and I'm not sure how one differentiates uh, between those two. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks, Keith. We just have a couple other comments. Virginia says, thanks for your time. And uh, Angela is joining from Australia, and I just wanted to share that she thought the presentation was fantastic and um, sharing that the service um, that she's involved in tries to incorporate more patient narrative, uh, but they continue to search. So um, that's, uh, that's really interesting to know. Oh, sorry. Got a kitten behind me here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's great to see that places, and, and I do, I follow what's going on in, in Australia and New Zealand and they're working to get the patient engagement. Um, so that's, the focus of pain BC really, um, or one of the, you know, I would say one of the golden pillars of pain BC is that patient, patient engagement. And in until, and it's probably my soapbox and that comes through in, in my presentation is until we get systems that actively engage people meaningfully and not just checking a box, um, I don't think we're going to see the, the change that we need to see. So it's, it's, it's a tough road to hoe. It's, it's changing. Uh, pain BC is part of a uh, global patient alliance. It's been set up by IASP. And I'm, I'm hoping we're starting to see um, true effort being put into patient engagement on a global scale. 